Welcome to another edition of the Dementia Care Partner Talk Show. Now, here's dementia care expert Tifa Snow and your host, Greg Phelps. Hello and welcome to the Dementia Care Partners Podcast, brought to you by Raz Mobility. Raz Mobility is thrilled to offer the Raz Memory Cell Phone. It's uniquely designed for individuals with dementia. There's no other cell phone that's easier to use. It consists of one screen with pictures and names underneath. To make calls, the senior simply taps and holds the picture of the person they wish to call. That's it. Care partners control the RAS memory cell phone remotely through an online portal or app, allowing care partners to manage the phone rather than the senior. The RAS memory cell phone allows seniors to continue to use the cell phone even as their condition becomes more challenging. For more information, visit www.rasmobility.com. I'm your host, Greg Phelps, along with Tipa Snow. And, and Tipa, in listening in on the uh, online conference, I, I heard a lot of talk about the cerebellum. So what exactly is this? And why is it we're talking about this all of a sudden? Like, it's not like we just discovered it. It's been there for a while. Yeah, it has been there pretty much as up earlier than your other, the cortical brain, at least. So you actually have three brain centers, if you will. You have the medulla oblongata, which handles the really core responsibility of heartbeat and respiration and some of the real basic stuff that humans need to survive. Kind of essentials, yeah. The essentials, the things you have to keep going, whether you're sleeping, whether you're awake, whether you're unconscious. If you're if your medulla oblongata goes out, you're dead, essentially. Um, and it has wiring to and from other sections of the brain. And then the other one we've spent a lot of time talking about is the cortex, which is the big brain. It's the one up there, the thinking brain. And it has wiring into more the primitive section. So we have the cortical brain, which helps you think. It helps you know what you're seeing, recognize rhythm and language, and have movement and sensation. But there's this what's called the little brain, and it's down underneath the occipital lobe at the back, and it forms a second little hump down there, and it's called the little brain. I mean, that's what cerebellum means, is little brain. And so it's the little brain. Now, its job, it has two sides to it, but its job is very different. Its job is to take what you used to have to think about doing and turn it into a rhythmic pattern so that you can do it without thinking. So the example a lot of people might use is riding a bicycle. When you're first learning to ride a bicycle, it's very complicated because you're working on gravity awareness and moving your legs and keeping your balance. But over time, you get really good at it. And pretty soon you've got the, the what are called reciprocal movement of your legs, but you can keep your arms and you can, you can do a lot of things while you're riding the bike because your brain is not having to think about riding the bike because your cerebellum is doing this incredible job of wiring itself in and out, in and out. And it's a stop off. It's, it's something that's in between. Now, for the longest time, we thought that's what its job was, that we thought that was its only job. Now, to be fair, it has very different looking cells than your, cerebell, your cerebellum. No, your cerebrum. Cerebrum. Okay, cerebrum, cerebellum. Cerebrum, your thinking brain has a, has a body of a cell and it has arms out in either directions. One is bringing stuff in called axons, and then it has these branches out the other side called dendrites. So in and out, messages flow through the body of the cell out the other side. Your cerebellum looks really, really, really different. And it's it's created for a different purpose. And so it's it's sending really fast and really automatic messages in many ways. But what it includes is emotion. So it can make you feel emotional. So if when you're riding the bike, you get in the, what do we call it when you're in that place where it feels really good? You're in the, in the zone. Yeah. In the zone. And it is just effortless. You've got the rhythm going. And if you think you lose your I mean, lose your mojo. Yeah. Yeah. It's just all gone. <laughs> That's your cerebellum doing its thing. And get what guess what you get when you get in the zone? Guess what happens? Well, uh, what do they call it? A runner's high or a cyclist's high? You get a rush. Yeah. It's that chemical stuff where you're going, yeah. 
yeah, this is super, this is so cool. And so any kind of sports person will describe this phenomena to you. And we've all had it where you're just doing such a good job. And then all of a sudden I've had it when I've sewn or anything that you do that requires sensory motor, you feel so empowered because it, it's working. And then on the other side, it starts coming apart. And then what happens? What happens emotionally? Mm. Yeah, where you start fizzling out to your just basically short circuiting. Right? No, don't. That's not working. Leave it alone. And so that that crash and burn. So what we're finding is because the cells are shaped so differently, our brain, we thought for the longest time, cerebellum doesn't really have anything to do with dementia in general, because movement patterns are one of the last things to actually go. But what we're finding is we're wrong. When we look carefully at movement patterns and timing of movement patterns and the ability to move effortless, effortlessly, um, that actually can come and go for people. And so what we're finding out is the cerebellum has a role to play and it could possibly account for some of these emotional fritzes because it, it, it can't find the mojo. It can't find the rhythm. It can't find that, how do you do this thing? And it frustrates the thinking brain because the thinking brain hasn't had to think about this stuff. And it's going, well, just do it. You know how to do it. Does, does it work the other way around on occasion, Tifa? Because uh -huh. we, we've seen people who can barely move all of a sudden they get up and waltz and dance and sing. Cha -ching, cha -ching. So it is both magic, but it also is impacted by the condition. I think the thing that's new is to think about the cerebellum as having a role in all of this. Because because it was only seen as a rhythm section and things like bouncing a basketball while you go down the court or riding a bike, people thought, well, it's not going to be really a, a big deal when it comes to dementia. And it's like, as people are looking in the cerebellum, they're going, oh, wait a minute, maybe there is a deal here. Maybe there is something because it does have override switches and it can create emotional excitement, emotional distress. It can short circuit some things, but it could also be showing us signs of and signals that things are not working as well as we think they are. So it's interesting. I mean, it's just new discovery, actually. Mm -hmm. And all of this begs a further question. Do you think there's still more discoveries about how seemingly insignificant parts of the brain may wow. be related to brain change? Because we just saw a home run right there and... Cha-ching. Yeah, so I think what we have always believed we understood about dementia, what we're finding out is, boy, did we really get off base on a few things. You know, just the idea that it's all about beta amyloid plaque or it's all just about neurofibrillary tangles. When now we're backing up and going, well, maybe it's actually more about glial cells and housekeeping um, because if you don't keep the environment clean, cells don't do well. So, and maybe some, some beta amyloid is, is actually helpful because it reduces inflammation kinds of stuff, but then you get to a certain point. And so maybe it's actually about the immune system. Wow. And so where's the immune system going to come into play? Oh, let's say the cerebellum and the oh, medulla oblongata. Oh, crap. <laughs> so uh, a further complication to all of this is now all of the research that has been done into medications may have been looking in the wrong corner. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, but maybe how we were looking at it um, sort of like in, in the science of looking at cancer, the power of the immune system to sort of help to try to resolve things and rather suppressing immune systems. Sometimes what we're saying is, you know what, maybe we need to activate immune systems with the autoimmune diseases. We're finding out a lot about autoimmune diseases. You know, more antibiotics isn't necessarily the answer. Maybe what we need to do is introduce things in a way that the body doesn't overreact to it because we're actually causing ourselves harm by making it so intolerable for any little irritant that we over respond, over react, and we create drama for ourselves when what we actually need to do is find a gentler wave pattern. So once again, we know something, but we really perhaps know nothing. Maybe not as much as we think we know. And when we think we've got this whole thing licked, maybe there is the element of being human versus an another animal that has some impact on whether or not 
a cure is going to be what we think it is. Tipa, thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. You've been listening to the Care Partners podcast series brought to you by Positive Approach to Care and RAS Mobility. Hi, I'm Tipa Snow, and you just found our YouTube channel and watched one of our videos. I'm the owner and founder of Positive Approach to Care. Thanks for watching. And if you liked, if you have a comment about, or you would, please share it with people you know. Oh, and if you haven't yet done it, consider subscribing. We'll let you know when the next new video comes out. And you might want to visit our website, www.tipasnow.com, where you'll find other resources as well. See you there.